Hello everyone, and welcome to the Quorum Podcast. This is where academic medicine meets remote, austere, and resource-limited areas. Welcome back to the program. This is Avery Kelly. This week, I am with Dr. Tom Mallinson. Tom is on our teaching faculty. He is the program lead for the Bachelors of Paramedic Program, which is a recent promotion. Congratulations, Tom. Thank you very much. So we have published a article that that drops last August in the Journal of Paramedic Practice. And Tom and I wrote on that about prolonged field care and how it applies to the civilian ambulance setting. And this was all Tom's idea. Tom, where did you get this idea of research? So I think, so uh, as loads of listeners will know, prolonged field care has been knocking around in the military and tactical world for ages and 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 for very obvious reasons and then I realized that in on the civilian side with one of my other jobs I was talking to some of the remote and rural GPs and they were talking about we we need a kit bag that that is set up and and contains the guidelines for managing a patient for 48 hours 72 hours if, if we're not going to get a helicopter for that amount of time, we need to continue providing care. And especially in Scotland, some of the rural islands are quite small. There's limited resources, so it's a limited resource setting. And, and obviously critical illness doesn't respect geography. So, so people still get sick on very small islands. And I realised that they would, all they were asking for was, we need a prolonged field care kit bag and we need prolonged field care guidelines because standard NHS guidelines assume that you can wheel the patient up to HDU to a critical care unit. They assume that you can phone down the anaesthetist to, to start the inotropes for you. But if you're the only clinician and you're on an island and you've only got limited medications and limited equipment, suddenly none of those standard guidelines really apply. So, So I guess that was one side. And then the other side was um, talking to UK student paramedics who are getting fed up of of waiting outside hospitals to offload patients to hospital. So they might be spending a whole shift on an ambulance but see one patient. And, And quite rightly, their concern was that their education was limited because they were meant to be learning to be a paramedic, but maybe saw one patient in eight hours. And... And I'm not arguing that that is appropriate or that, or that they should be waiting outside hospital for eight hours. But I, I saw that gap, that, that potential gap in care where they've provided excellent paramedic care. They've, they've provided the primary survey. They've provided the secondary survey. They've provided immediate life, th- life threat treatments. Um, and then they're sitting with a patient for eight hours. And they haven't really had any training in looking after a patient for eight hours because traditionally that's not civilian paramedic practice. So, so that was the connection to the, the prolonged field care work we're doing in the college. And I thought, oh, the, most of prolonged field care is just a mindset. It's a, it's a change of how you look at caring for your patient. So that's why Abraham and myself came together and, and we thought, oh, we'll, we'll just outline what prolonged field care is. We will put the argument out there that this should be part of the, of civilian paramedic education, whether because you're waiting outside a, a hospital for eight hours or if it takes you three hours or four hours to get to a hospital, um, you should you should probably be aware of the concept of prolonged field care and and the core tenets. So that's what led us to, to, to basically present that in the Journal of Paramedic Practice and to say this is a... This is a model. This is a framework of conceptualizing that care during that period. And I really just wanted to put it out there for for critique and for feedback and to to get people thinking about it. Uh, Something I hadn't thought about because uh, prolonged field care is definitely uh, comes from the the special forces background and the prolonged care working group with with Paul Lose and and Dennis Jarima, who are in our master's programs, they and, and Dr. Sean Keenan. Uh, set this for those of us who are Green Berets, but this is a mindset. This is something that, uh, uh, well, Sean Keenan has pushed and spearheaded this for civilian practice with the Austrian Emergency mm. Care. We've run three courses now here in, in Europe. 
which is very much applicable, but it, it's deeper than that. So here in our paramedic program, we expect our paramedics to see 20 to 30 patients in a shift at KCMC or other places where they're they're working. And the learning curve drops profoundly if you're sitting with one casualty mm. for eight hours. Because it's, you know, I recognize it's easy for us to say to that student paramedic, oh, there's lots of there's lots of care you could be providing for that patient. But I think at some point during eight hours, you you stop learning paramedic practice skills, really. Uh, so we, we're not arguing that we want people to be looking after a patient for eight hours. But the reality of the global reality is that paramedics are increasingly working in austere places. Those austere places are becoming closer to home in that they might be, you know, you might be fifth in the queue outside your local hospital. And that's still austere because you you haven't got direct access to hospital facilities. You're providing care with whatever's in the ambulance. Um, and, and yeah, I think this has been around the military for ages and military medics listening will will be very familiar with these concepts. But we we seem to have forgotten to teach it on the civilian side. Um, I, I can imagine that a lot of degree paramedics in the UK and, and the certificate paramedic, paramedics in the States uh, and other places aren't even touching this because, of course, you just turf off your, your old granny that fall, fell uh, into an A&E department or ER department after 20 minutes and, and you go have a, have a bite to eat at the uh, local constabulary, but uh, that's just not happening. And, and I heard, was it 16 hours in Wales is the record of somebody yeah. sitting in a car park. Yeah. And I, and I think we, certainly in the UK, we're making good progress at developing paramedic expertise in critical illness and critical care. We're developing paramedic excellence in urgent and primary care. But I think there's still this gulf in between, which is essentially standard paramedic care, but but elongated and, and pushed out to eight hours. So, so this prolonged field care isn't really covered by those expert paramedics in critical care or those expert paramedics in urgent care because it's in between. It, it's a bit of both. It's it's interesting. I, I started the college because I saw a niche to, to address these issues, but from an austere medic point of view, someone working in the Serengeti, someone working on the oil rigs, someone working in, in an operational environment. And here we are eight years later, and this is applicable to every medic coming out of a paramedic program. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's that frustration that it's applicable to loads of people, but they don't really have any guidance on how to do it. Um, I'm, I'm just going to jump to the Defense Health Agency's definition of what is prolonged field care to see if it uh, rings a bell with any civilian medics out there queuing outside a hospital. They said it's field medical care applied beyond doctrinal plans timelines to decrease patient morbidity and mortality. Prolonged field care uses limited resources and is sustained until the patient arrives at the next appropriate level of care. Now, to me, that e- that that explains waiting for a helicopter in a remote clinic. But it equally applies to you've got someone moderately unwell in your ambulance outside your district general hospital. I think it's the, the same definition applies. Yeah, it, it's it's the, the delay of care. Even if you have one of the GPs or or, or any docs coming out to your ambulance and saying, "What's what's the news score of your casualty?" News is a way to quickly assess the casualty. It's a national early warning score that. They're used all over the place, modified early warning score. So you are getting a doc coming out and checking on your patient. But 16 hours in, in Wales, eight hours is consistently happening in the UK. In the States, it's happening as well. And this is something that Tom and I decided to address using the PFC guidelines that came in from Special Forces and, and has been published in 2013 14 by the Special Operations Medical Association, where, where Tom got to attend for the first time earlier this year. And I've been presenting there, uh, it'll be the fifth time, I think, on the next one. So uh, using this knowledge for Special Forces is grand. This is what we do. But our premise is we can use these learning outcomes, the, these skills for the civilian paramedic. Yeah, and I think those those guidelines have... Clearly, some of those guidelines are very military-orientated. 
Some of those guidelines could be lifted wholesale and dropped into civilian practice. So how to, ass- if, how to assess whether an arterial tourniquet needs to remain in place. If it doesn't, how to safely remove it and convert it to a hemostatic dressing. That's a, that's a core training element in, in military care, but it's not something we, we really face in civilian practice because we always assume, oh, we'll just, we'll just drive down the road 20 minutes, we'll offload them to the hospital, and then it's the hospital's job. On a, on a quick detour, I, after doing some of this, I spoke to some emergency medicine doctors and I said, oh, do you guys all complete training in tourniquet conversion? Is that, is that a standard part of the syllabus? And the general answer I got was, oh, no, we don't touch tourniquets. We wait for the surgeon to come down, which makes sense. But then you're saying the paramedic can't uh, convert, remove that tourniquet. Then the emergency medicine specialist can't remove that tourniquet. You've got to wait for the surgeon who, as we all know, might be busy. They might be uh, up in theatres. They might be scrubbed for a fairly long case. So suddenly we've got this whole bunch of excellent clinical practice guidelines from the US military and quite an obvious scope for for looking at their application into civilian practice, which we, we certainly need to do. Clearly, some of the other guidelines do, don't directly, um, they don't directly uh, apply in the same way, but, but some of them can literally be, be picked up and dropped into civilian practice. Others need to be looked at and, and going back to the evidence base behind them and seeing how that applies to the different population. Um, but I think that's probably the next step of of looking at the actual clinical practice guidelines. So in, in our article for the Journal of Paramedic Practice, we didn't delve into the specifics, clinical practice guidelines as such, in, in as much depth, but we did focus on the, the core concepts. So there, these are concepts of considering and planning for prolonged field care. So in, in the article, we've got the, the 12 core capabilities. So that was originally 10, and then we or someone much cleverer than I added on two extras. I think it might have been Sean, Sean Keenan, Sean yeah. Keenan who, um, who quite rightly pointed out that in military practice, there is always a plan for logistics and there is always a plan for communications. Whether or not that comes together in reality, there is at least a fairly robust plan. Um, so he added those two on to remind us in civilian practice that you need, you need an appropriate communication plan. You need a primary um, a communication plan, an alternative for contingency and emergency using the PACE uh, acronym, for example, things like that, that that we perhaps aren't as good at in civilian practice. Um, so we outline that in our in our article. We also cover the the concept of ruck, truck, house, and plane as a way of conceptualizing what kit and equipment and level of care you can realistically provide out of your rucksack, out of your ambulance, out of a clinic. I suppose for the UK, maybe we should adapt that for, you can probably provide a higher level of care when you're stationary outside a hospital waiting to offload than you can when you're driving down the A9 in the middle of winter. Uh, so we, we, we address that more to get people thinking about applying that to civilian practice. And then, um, and then we address the, the two other acronyms, I think, kind of summarise the, the core concept of prolonged field care. And, and they are also beautifully named, uh, so hopefully they're easy to remember, those being Hitman and then Hitman leading on to a bit of sheep vomit. <laughs> so as someone who keeps sheep, it's always amusing to see a bit of uh, sheep vomit uh, jumping into uh, uh, a, a journal article. You don't see that very often. <laughs> We are, we are seeing it more and more as, as it's uh, slowly getting out there. I was looking at the minutes of a conference I've never heard of, and sure enough, it popped up as sheep vomit. So Hitman has been around, and, and we have to give appreciation to the Hereford lads, and they came up with Hitman. I first heard of it in '09 when I was teaching on the Bows course in, in Fort Blockhouse for the Brits, and they had nicked it, of course, from the Hereford lads. And, and even before that, I was teaching with, with John Hagman and the Deployment Medicine International. We were, we were teaching this, but he hadn't a, a an acronym. He hadn't the, the Hitman concept or the, the SF guys have uh, ravines, which I'm not as fond of. Hitman seems to work quite well. So 
so since the the Hereford lads, the SAS have 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 published this, it's it's hit the ground running. It's it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere, and and we've adopted it in the college because it fits perfectly with our CABC system. So we have CABC D E F and G, and we've added uh, E F E is environmental, F is full set of vitals. And G is get documentation, and it rolls right into Hitman. And, and the reason for that is, you are doing your patient assessment, your your primary secondary survey, and then you roll right in to prolonged care. You you don't hesitate, you don't walk. And even if you're working in a city based environment and you're on your way to a hospital, there's no reason why you shouldn't be working, moving right into Hitman. So, uh, and in the sheep vomit, I have to blame another uh, Green Beret and I that uh, came up with this. We may or may not have been sober uh, in Pretty Bay here in Malta, but uh, Jason Jorvis uh, was with me in first special force group. And I nicked him as soon as uh, he left Hagman's organization and he taught here in Malta for a bit, still teaches for us. So we, we sat down with a pint or two of Chisk beer, some of the local beer. And we came up with a mnemonic that's going to meet these nursing care or patient care requirements. So sheep vomit is, uh, well, he, uh, Jason came up with it. I was coming up with uh, probably less appropriate uh, acronyms, and, and we stuck with sheep vomit. So for the the 0.5% of you out there listening who haven't heard of PFC or haven't heard of Hitman sheep vomit, we can quickly go through this. But we're going to go through the whole mnemonic with the premise of civilian-based paramedics. Because uh, those of us who are soft background, we, we have this. This is tattooed somewhere on our body. We use it so much. So the hitman for civilian-based environments is just as applicable and just as important for for the civilian paramedic. And H is head to toe, and we, we kind of do this in our secondary survey. So here at the college, we wait until Hitman, prolonged care, to do a careful head to toe examination, which we, we, we just get our fingers on every inch of the body, making sure we haven't missed anything uh, that, that was seen during the catastrophic hemorrhage and, and minor circulation uh, problems. So head to toe and, and getting all the, the, the bloody stuff off. And I, from my practice, I, I found it really interesting seeing Hitman, the H, the head to toe exam, coming in so early here. So when I was working on intensive care, one of the first things we did when a patient reached us, uh, especially if it was a trauma, was undertook a full head-to-toe examination because it's such an easy thing to miss because quite understandably you're, you're managing other priorities, but it would often get to that level of, you know, level three intensive care, and then you'd find quite a few injuries that, that no one had picked up. And I suspect that there is time in the patient's journey before they reach us on critical care where someone could do a full head to toe examination. So it's nice to, to see that reminder of, do you have time? Do you have time to do a quick head to toe? Do you have time to do a thorough head to toe? Um, so I think, that, and, and that's really nice. It, it adds to the C, A, B, C, D, E, F, G alphabet, which is handy, but also it, it kind of fits in. You've done your quick secondary survey and it's really a reminder to do a, more thorough secondary serving, which is great. I recall a, a patient I had that uh, was, was definitely in a longer environment in, in South Africa. And uh, we got through, we started the Hitman and, and, and stopped all the major bleeding and had a line in and, and, and made, just made sure that uh, the CABCs are sorted. We got to H and he was like, uh, yeah, my back hurts. I'm like, bloody hell, I looked at that during breathing. And so I rolled him over and there's a tape roll that he's been laying on mm. for 15 minutes whilst I was going through my assessment that was causing him an undue pain. Yeah. And that's something that we can see whilst we uh, do our head to toe. And it's easy, isn't it? You know, those, those errors or just you didn't have time to take all the gravel off someone's back when you were fixing airway breathing circulation problems. But you probably need to address that fairly soon. Um, but we won't get ahead of ourselves because that uh, pressure points does come up later. It does. So after you've done the head to toe and you've got just uh, fluffy things on, on around keeping them warm and uh, nothing is wet, we can move on to infection. So to quote John Hagman, which was probably one of the most profound orators I've ever listened to. I could listen to his OMS lecture again and again and again. And every time I learned something new, profound, profound clinician. 
So his, his idea was infection is something that you have to address very quickly. And you have six hours before you start losing cool points on a wound. And those of us in city-based paramedic system, we never think about this, right? We're, oh, six hours, but it, we're going to get the guy into an A&E before six hours is coming up. But if he's sitting in a car park in, in, in the UK and or anywhere in the world, and six hours goes by and you've got a bandage on that wound, you're not thinking about the fact that you're losing, you're losing cold points. You're going to start seeing signs of infection. So what we do is we irrigate. We, we well, clean out that infected wound. We uh, do, a, uh, well, three liters is the rule of Tom we say in the college here, three liters of water you're willing to put in your eye, so a normal saline or, or tap water, and just irrigate that out, and then you do wet to dry dressings so you can make sure that you minimize that infection. And we also think about antibiotics, and, and Doc Hagman used to always say that he figured out the best time to give antibiotics is about 10 minutes before the wounding happens. And it's, it's not a premise to start giving antibiotics to everyone who's in an operational <laughs> environment, but it's a premise to, to um, be fastidious about that. And I think, you know, I, speaking from my own paramedic education, I think there is the temptation of once you've put a dressing on a wound, it's covered, it's out of sight. Um, it's, it's very easy to forget about that injury. Um, so this is the, the prompt that you probably can't forget about it for six or eight hours. I think, again, from my own practice, it's very easy to not irrigate a wound with, with a couple of liters because that's, that's messy, it's challenging, it's hard work. It might cool the patient down, which we don't want. But if we approach that in a mindful capacity, you can do that without creating hypothermia. I think the other thing for me that, that is in infection is we, we now sometimes give antibiotics pre-hospitally to patients. Um, but how many of us consider when the second dose is due? Yeah, that, that's infection. And uh, we, do, we want to make sure that uh, we change that wet to dry dressings every 12 hours. I, I like if I'm in, a, in a, a camp or in a remote area, it's morning and night. So they come in and they, for, for breakfast and you say, All right, lads, let's see the, uh, the wound. And you take the uh, wet to dry dressings out. You clean it out again put new ones on, and then it comes in for, for supper, and it's the same thing. So every 12 hours, you want to check that infected wound. So that's H and I. So T is tubes and tidy in Hitman. T, T is making sure that your casualty is clean, that it doesn't have any grubby stuff on them, uh, dried blood or dried uh, uh, dirt or anything like that. And I, So for me, the tubes and tidy always gives me flashbacks to any encounter with an intensive care nurse because... Uh, you guys are always very clear that uh, when I was working on, on critical care as a doctor, that essentially I turned up and I made a mess and I put the tubes in the wrong order and I tied knots in, in wires. And uh, so I always get flashbacks to those nurses being very patient and very kind and trying to remind me that keeping things tidy is better for the patient and safer for the patient. Um, and again, we, we, we don't manage that when we initially see our patients in pre-hospital care because the priority is obtaining a pulse ox, a pulse ox reading, it's, it's obtaining a blood pressure. But, you know, by the time you've had the patient for a couple of hours, things should be pretty tidy and, and squared away. Um, so that's always flashes into my mind for tubes and tidy. And also any, any tube that we put in the body, uh, we need to make sure it's patent. So if I put a line in, I want to make sure I flush that from time to time. Or tidy means that uh, as a critical care paramedic, we love wires, don't we? We've got tons of wires and lines and everything going. It looks like spaghetti. So you're losing cool points. So getting a bit of tidiness. I like close pegs, close pin, close pegs, pins, yeah. and, and uh, just making sure all the wires are out of the way so they don't get pulled out. I, one, one thing about T, I was remiss. T is for tourniquets. So this is where you will look at a need of a tourniquet and either downgrade or reposition the tourniquets, and that's in T and Hitman. Nice. So moving on from your tubes and tidy is, is medicine. So we've already had a little reminder about uh, repeating antibiotics for infection specifically, but this is, is a general medicines review. So it's, it's everything from have you documented everything you've administered? Have you, have you considered the, the next dose of medication? So maybe you've, you've given someone a dose of paracetamol or non-steroidal, When's the next dose due? Because they will be due another dose. If, if you've dosed them with one of the opiates, 
Perhaps you're using fentanyl that wears off very quickly, morphine that has a bit of a longer uh, duration of action. You either need to redose those or convert that patient to different medication options. And then the, the other one that I think, again, speaking from, from personal practice, I think we are terrible at is reviewing a patient's medications for essential medications and those which are time critical, as in the time they are administered is critical. So if you mess with someone's um, medications for their Parkinson's, that's going to have a, a fairly significant knock-on effect. That's going to really impact that patient's journey. It's going to impact how they experience their, their health care and, and their journey through our healthcare care system. Um, the other big one, obviously, being the anti-epileptics. So, uh, you know, people, people who have epilepsy do also lead normal lives and, and break an ankle, um, break a leg, have an asthma attack. And we can get sidetracked treating those other things. But clearly, if we, if we miss their regular dose of these important medications, we're just going to create problems for these patients. We're essentially creating iatrogenic harm, which is the last thing we want. And, and it's far away from the gold standard that we want to be giving these patients. So a Hitman is administration, and this is where you can kind of take a break, uh, rebomb your kit, get get more kit, order more kit. You can do telemedicine again if you need. You can make sure you document everything. You can make sure that you're getting food. You you can, if you need a bit of a kip, if you need rest, you can talk to somebody and have them look at vital signs and wake you up if uh, vital signs change. But admin is so important for, for your own well-being. And again, in, in UK practice, this used to be a huge challenge of you rocked up to the hospital and you couldn't restock your ambulance because you're at the hospital and not the ambulance station. And I think in some areas are... are are sorting out that administrative problem that you can now re-kit your ambulance with consumables at the hospital. So, so making that change was instigating um, some of the, the capabilities, the 12 capabilities of prolonged field care and facilitating the administration phase, um, which, which is excellent. So we're, we're doing these things, but we didn't quite realize it was prolonged field care. So the N is, is the big one. That's the big elephant in the room, nursing care, and uh, Tom and I were talking before we started this recording on the misnomer of that. It's not nursing care. It's just patient care. But we are, we are going to use the N for nursing because we, it, it fits for, for the HITMAN. Uh, we can't just say HIT, hit map. Um, it's not as cool. It's not it? as cool. And the SAS would probably get angry. So we'll, we'll look at this as N is, is nursing care. And so what the college has done is we have replaced the N or we, we have allocated the N to be uh, representative of the entire sheep vomit. Uh, and this is, uh, we'll go through this and we'll discuss the the nursing items that need to be uh, dealt with, uh, starting with skin protection. Yeah, so so we have skin protection and then later we consider pressure areas. So the the first skin protection is much more for for patients still outside or where there's any extreme in temperature, I consider that a little bit in here as well. So this is things like, are they, is your patient in the shade? If not, do they need sunscreen applied? Do they need protection from biting insects? Do, uh, you know, what's your, what's your approach to these things? And, and I think this is, a, this is an element that we can ignore a lot in civilian practice because it, it doesn't come up for every patient. But then every now and then, so, so from my personal experience, when I was in the Derby Mountain Rescue Team, we had a patient who uh, had experienced an injury and we were waiting for the Coast Guard to come and winch him up for us because that was the, the best extrication option. And we as a mountain rescue team were having a lovely day. It was middle of summer. The sun was beating down. We, we got to have a romp around the hills and then look after this chap. Um, but he was wrapped in our standard uh, vacuum mattress and then had the sun shining right in his face. So we very quickly had to think, oh, can, what are the options? Can we move him to shade, um, which we couldn't do because we didn't want a tree falling on him when the helicopter came over and blew them all over. So we, uh, we uh, had an ask around for the coolest pair of sunglasses and donated them to the chap and then uh, had to um, allocate someone to just being a, a, a personal sunshade for this, for this guy until the helicopter turned up. So I think... Hopefully, most of the time, um, certainly in, in the UK, sun isn't an issue that often. Um, we don't yet have, have too many biting insects. We've got the midges up in Scotland, 
we don't uh, luckily we haven't got any malaria carrying mosquitoes yet um, in England but I'm sure give it a couple of months uh, and they'll be knocking around yeah um, so I so I think skin protection hopefully is fairly simple for most of civilian practice hopefully you can get them in the ambulance you can get them out of the sun you can you can close the doors you can shoo out the midges um, but then that really I think that skin protection leads on really nicely to to heat management or hypothermia and hyperthermia management. There's a lot of research and a lot of push for the, the hypothermia and, and the, the triad or pentagon of, of uh, blood coagulation. Whatever Ricky's going to come up with next is going to be brilliant. But so the, the hypothermic patient doesn't coagulate and, and the hypo, per, hypothermic patient and the hyperthermic patient is going to whinge. And I, I just don't want to hear that whinging. So <laughs> let's, let's take care of that. So you want to make sure they're not too hot or too cold. Most of the time we're looking at cold. So whilst working in, in Tanzania, it's 42, 43 C out. Everyone's dripping sweat, but you're working on this person versus auto trauma patient and they're cold because they are traumatic. So even though you're dripping, uh, it, it, you have to make sure you have hypothermia management on, on your casualty. And, and that's where the challenge comes in, right? So you, you might have a really excellent hypothermia management plan, but the risk is that you then, uh, you bundle them up, you've, you've passively or actively rewarmed them, and then there's the risk that you knock them over into heat-related illness. Um, or equally during, you know, even in, in London, in the big cities in the UK, when we get a heat wave, we get a huge spike of uh, classic heat stroke deaths among the, the older population and the younger population. Um, and especially those with polypharmacy, if you think about the medications these patients are on before you even saw them, um, plenty of those medications predispose uh, to heat-related illness. Um, and we've put a little table in the Journal of Paranormal Practice article of some of the more common uh, medications, polypharmacy, these patients might be on that predisposes them to heat-related illness. So uh, check that out in the article. So that's S and H. The, the first E is elevate the head. And there's some really good research on PubMed on that 30-degree head elevation. And it's not just the ICP. The, the head injury, of course, you're going to elevate but everyone needs to be elevated. And the reason is you're going to have the person sit up if possible. Obviously, a pelvic fracture, you might frown on that a bit. But if they can sit up, they're going to interact in the world around them, which is going to cause, calm them down. They're going to look and see what, what's happening, be part of their environment, and it's going to calm them down a bit. So everyone needs to have the elevated head. And I think for, for anyone listening who has managed to clear those anesthetic and intensive care exams, you will have spent many hours reading the different uh, ventilation and oxygenation of a, an erect lung and a supine lung, and you'll know that the huge difference it makes just sitting a patient up, they'll, they'll oxygenate better, they'll have less at atelectasis. Um, you know, we can make such, such a big difference just by sitting a patient up and thinking, does this, does this patient need to be flat on their back? I know that's traditional in medicine, but, but you know, is, would you want to be forced to lie straight on your back for eight hours? Probably not. You'd probably rather sit up, look around, have a sip of water, wouldn't you? Um, and I guess that, you know, that change from making someone lie still and lie on their back um, and letting them sit up leads us on to the second E, which is exercises. So it, it's good to keep the person active. Uh, and we'll talk about DVT a bit later, but so there there's a physiological benefit to having them do the range of motion and, 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 and movement. And that's your lymph, your lymphatic system. So your, your lymph system is a low pressure. And the only way that you're moving things is with muscle contraction. So your white blood cells, your immune system is going to be a lot better if you have someone uh, doing some range of motion or mo movement or exercises. And if you're dealing with this casualty for days at a time, you definitely want to have the exercises so they don't get atrophic. And just from a from a personal interaction point of view, it gives you something to do with your patient that's positive. There's a positive impact on their health rather than just sitting there waiting outside a hospital for hours. So, so there's there's physiologic benefit, there's psychologic benefit, which is what we want. Leading on to P, so we're reaching the end of the sheep. I think it's the front end because uh, it's the end vomit's coming out of. We're getting on to P for pressure relief and 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 the risk of pressure danger. So 
I think it, certainly in UK permanent practice, we we are much more keyed into the risks of pressure damage now. We've we've moved away from keeping people on rescue boards. Um, certainly, when I started, you'd you'd extricate someone on a rescue board, which we then called a spinal board, and you'd keep them on it for their whole journey to hospital. And I think that's dying a death now because the the knowledge that pressure injury can develop in in twenty to thirty minutes in in susceptible patients. I think that message has got through. Um, I think the next step of that is uh, anyone who's lying lying still and not being repositioned, they can be getting pressure injury um, really quickly. And, and you need to you need to think about that at least every every hour or two hours. And that might be someone you know simple. They don't have to be unconscious. But if I've broken my femur, I'm probably not wriggling around in that bed because it's probably going to be sore every time I wriggle. So you need to think about how you can manage that pain, but manage that pain to enable a degree of repositioning in the bed, because the last thing you want is to add a pressure injury onto whatever it was that brought them into your care in the first place. So a vacuum mattress is obviously the best practice for somebody with a pelvic injury. You can you can still move them out of their, their pressure on, on their buttocks and on their back by canting the the vacuum splint like 15 20 degrees from left side to right side and you're going to keep them immobile but then that pressure is going to come off as sacrum so it can be something as minor as that and i think again that's in you know with in, in uk's paramedic practice we're well aware of wedging our obstetric patients we still don't have those wedges provided on ambulances but it's it's a very similar theory of just you know maybe a 10 15 degree tilt either way uh, moves that pressure um, pressure burden around different areas of tissue. So I think that that is the end of the sheep and on to the vomit. So yeah, vomit starts with with vital signs. And we, yes, we do this during the, the, the CABC, and, but it's trending. So if you want to be a good medic, if you want to be a good austere critical care provider, you need to trend. So the V in vomit is just a reminder to, you need to be trending your vital signs. You need to continue to get the vital signs that are appropriate to, to make sure you get that trending. And the college we use CPRO, we're rather fond of that with capillary refill, pulse, respiratory, and oximetry. And the reason we like that is you only need an SpO2 monitor to get it, where BP cough takes a while and we, we'll do the CPRO quickly, but uh, we want to maintain the the vital sign trending and i think it's just again something probably in civilian practice we are not as good at we're very good at getting the initial set of vital signs we're very good at getting the second one probably to show that we've improved things but perhaps not as good as as doing as abra says that track and trigger that monitoring the trend so it's just a reminder to you know decide how often you're going to be doing those vital signs and, and start tracking them that leads us on to the O in vomit, uh, which is a reminder for oral hygiene, which I think certainly is something we we just gloss over and we ignore probably in, in civilian practice. Um, we know that, hopefully all of us know that we should be brushing our teeth twice a day, but unless we come from a nursing background, we probably don't consider oral hygiene for our patient necessarily. Clearly most patients can manage that themselves, but they can only do that if they're provided with a toothbrush and some toothpaste. They do need a bit of help with that. And, and we know that, you know, beyond the, the dental uh, implications, the dental care, we know that bacteria in the mouth um, can cause pneumonia. We know that patients that are less responsive are at higher risk of that. Um, and then, you know, less, less critically important, we know that um, lip moisturizer can be included in that oral hygiene regime. We know that it makes, it makes their experience more pleasurable, in, well, not pleasurable, I guess, just less miserable being a patient. You know, if you've already broken your femur, the last thing you want is is dry, cracked lips and you haven't brushed your teeth for 24 hours. You're going to feel less and less human, aren't you? Um, and I guess oral hygiene, hopefully we're all well aware that unconscious patients need meticulous oral hygiene and might need repeated oropharyngeal, nasopharyngeal suction. So that all comes in under O for oral hygiene. I found the easiest trick is just to get a 4x4 gauze or a clean T-shirt and you put that over your finger and then use that to, to rub off on the, the teeth. 
you might need to have a suction easy or something like that close to hand just in case but just a a physical uh, so if you don't have tooth pup, uh, toothpaste available uh, then you can you can just use the uh, the physical debridement or abrasion of a four by four gauze to remove a lot of the bacteria yeah and again, you know, this again, we have this in A and E. I'm sure if you're parked outside in A and E, there will be a toothbrush near you that you could um, obtain for your patient. So O O in vomit leads us on to the M M for massage. Um, so unfortunately, we're not talking about a relaxing, <laughs> sensual massage with with uh, some nice oils and 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 candles in the back of the ambulance. Uh, we do not advocate candles in the backs of ambulances at any time. Um, we're talking here about DVT prophylaxis. So we know that calf massage and ankle plantar flexion and dorsiflexion exercises are effective mechanical prophylaxis for deep vein thrombosis. Clearly, if your patient's conscious, uh, they can certainly be doing those exercises for themselves. That would be the most effective because you're getting active muscle um, uh, constriction. But equally, if they're unconscious, they probably need that doing for them every two hours at least. Um, at least until they can be in hospital and we can start thinking about things like compression stockings, are they suitable for a heparin, um, that kind of thing. But until then, this needs to be on your list of, of care for your patient. We know that a huge number of, of patients admitted to hospital end up with a, a deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism. And in many cases, they, that, that can really seriously affect their, their patient course and their patient outcome. And if we can make an early intervention to reduce that risk, we should be doing that. And massaging towards the heart is going to be helpful for your lymph, your lymphatic system as well. So that's the M in vom, vomit, and the I is ins and outs. And, and this is one, as, as paramedics, we just like to gloss over because who likes gooey stuff? But in prolonged care, you're going to have to deal, well, one way or another, you're going to have to deal with the things that are coming out of their, your patient. So be proactive. It's, it's easier to take care of it beforehand than after. So uh, you need to do a urine catch if possible. If uh, the person can stand up, then uh, you're lucky. But if they can't, you can figure out some way to get a used IV bag that is cut into one corner. Or you can use a number five eye gel for women as a shiwi to uh, make sure that you catch these things. And as far as the the defecation side of thing. My favorite is getting a, a triangular bandage or a, a t-shirt, their, their t-shirt, and you put around your, your hand and then you prop them up. And as they go, you're slowly moving your hand away from the buttocks. And so you're removing that from their skin. The problem in prolonged care is when feces gets onto the skin and it's just, it's an irritant and it's going to make my tent smell rubbish. So I, I want my <laughs> tent clinic to sound, to smell good. So I'm going to make sure that my ins and outs are managed. And then, of course, measuring. So we need a urine output of 30 mils per hour minimum trending. So we need to measure what's coming out. And, and I can imagine some of the, some of the, certainly UK civilian paramedics listening and thinking, well, that's great, but we, we don't have urine bottles. We don't have a bedpan. I've certainly been on the bedpan hunt around a hospital for the patient I have in the ambulance um, and just struggling to find something. And then, to be honest, not being very good at positioning someone on a bedpan because it's not something I do day to day. And I think, you know, with these things, there is room there to nudge your your clinical directorate, your medical directorate and say, what you know, what do we have in the way of bedpans, urinary bottles? What do we have in the way of cleaning foams to clean up? patients how, you know how how do we clean their skin and I, I think traditionally the answer has been we don't do that we just offload them into hospital but i think that's that's not appropriate anymore you can't leave you can't leave someone with with feces on their skin for i would argue any longer than you you have to but like when we're talking six hours eight hours 12 hours waiting outside a hospital that that needs taken care of and and we're the healthcare professionals looking after that patient so this is certainly an avenue where there's probably room to to be nudging your clinical directorate or medical directorate for provision of a couple of extra bits and pieces to allow for patient care. 
So that, that's the eye in sheep vomit. The T, the final one, is turn, cough, and deep breath. And, and basically what happens if you're stationary, you ha- your cilia of your lungs are going to slowly do, well, they're going to do their job, aren't they? They're going to pull all sorts of gunk from the bottom of your lungs and get it up to your trachea so you can cough it out. But you've been asleep or they are, are in not moving as much and you're not getting rid of that. You think in the morning, you, you might even notice this. You get up, you stretch, you move around, and you're coughing because over the, if you're lucky, eight hours of sleep you've had the night before, that cilia has done its job and gotten all sorts of stuff ready for you to expel as you get up and you take that deep breath. And the other thing is you want to expand your your lungs, your, your alveoli. You want your recruitment. So I think, you know, there's there's plenty of things conceptually within prolonged field care which require no additional equipment. There's, there's no additional money that your employer needs to spend. This is purely an upskilling yourself as a practitioner. I think there is the sub-question of what could your employer do to facilitate that prolonged field care. Um, and I think and I hope that our journal, our article in the Journal of Paranic Practice has raised these points to get you thinking, I've done my primary survey, my secondary survey, what comes next? What can I do next for this patient? So I... I would say to you, have a read of the article, have a consideration of a nursing care plan for a typical patient. Clearly, it will be uh, individualized, but every patient, um, well, very hopefully every patient you have is breathing. Hopefully, uh, the majority of them have their limbs, so they have the risk of those DVTs. You know, there are a number of interventions that the majority of your patients will be needing in terms of prolonged field care. So I guess my, my coming up to the closing, my question is, is this something that we as, as paramedics and pre-hospital care providers, do we need this in the bedrock of our education? Do we need to change from uh, our role as primary and secondary survey and the interventions associated with those? Do we need to reframe ourselves as a professional group and think our care for the patient is primary survey, secondary survey, and prolonged field care for as long as it takes until we deliver this patient to the next appropriate level of care. I don't think that's a big stretch. I I think in many undergraduate programs, there is room to incorporate this. There's room to incorporate that little bit of of, uh, longer patient care. Um, And I I would challenge you to think about the appropriateness of that in in relation to education near you uh, that you're delivering or that you're part of. Um, And I think that would be my question to you. So that is definitely a a point that we need to have paramedics on all sides of the the planet to think about, to incorporate if possible. Uh, There are tons of of curriculum that's already written. Dr. Sean Keenan has the Austrian Emergency Care, which we're all faculty of that addresses this issue of the civilian level. The prolonged field care working group at pfcare.org is going to be a good place for free 6.5 gigabytes of data that you can download with one click. And if for those of you who want to incorporate this into your academic practice, then start having a conversation. Talk with your program leads, talk with other, other paramedics and see if there is a need for this and if there is find a way to learn prolonged care and i guess as a as a very small plug but more as a as a networking we we on our bachelor's program certainly cover prolonged field care in year one year two and year three we revisit it in the same way that you'd revisit the primary survey so if if you are an educational provider at any level and you're thinking how do i how do i build that into my curriculum um, feel free to reach out to us and we can share what we're doing. We're, we're not saying we're doing the only way or the best way of teaching prolonged field care, but certainly the college has been doing it for a number of years now. And we, we'd we welcome any conversation with people who are looking at uh, providing prolonged field care education, pr- uh, thinking about improving it, changing it, how to adapt it or integrate it into their curriculum. Um, we're, we're always on board for those kind of conversations. So at the end of the day, you need to be better. You need to be a, a better person for your, for, for your, a better medic for your casualty. And at the end of the day, you're the only thing standing between death and your casualty. So be better, learn these skills, 
and go out and make the community around you a better place. Tom, it's a third time you've been on the podcast. I imagine we're going to see you again. And thank you very much. Fantastic. Always a pleasure. This has been a presentation from the College of Remote and Offshore Medicine. If you would like to earn CPD credits for this podcast, you can join the Council of Members. Being a member of the college gives you free CPD credit, free access for our virtual field guide, and discounts on our e-learning courses. You can join the team on our college website at quorum.edu.mt.